Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming. But I'm not really anxious. Sometimes a little nervous, but not really anxious about it. Any of you anxious tonight? Me. You, yes, Tim is anxious. Hey, wonderful reading, by the way. And prayer, thank you. All right, there it is. Spiritist tools to overcome anxiety. Um, as usual, I can't take any credit for the content tonight. Um, all of this comes from a wonderful book called Existential Conflicts. Um, there's a, a chapter in there on anxiety. Let's see, there's a, a copy of the book, all right? It was uh, channeled uh, via Devaldo Franco uh, from the spirit Joanna DeAngelis. For anybody that's ever read Joanna, uh, I, I think you'd agree. Very technical, very, uh, very in-depth, very um, sophisticated. I don't know what the right word is. It, it reminds me when I read her chapters. I, I can't sit down and just read her book page after page. I've got to stop. I've got to think about it. It reminds me of, of being in graduate school when I was studying and how I had to read the same page several times sometimes to get the concept or until I applied the concept uh, in everyday life. Um, it made more sense. So um, that's my, my take on her. It's amazing. She, she, um, she throws out the problem kind of in your face and lays out uh, the symptoms and causes. Um, but then at the end of her chapters, there's always a solution or the work that needs to be done to resolve. So they always end, end hopeful, if you know what I mean. Um, so let's jump into it. Just uh, out of curiosity, one thing I can say is not from the book, is some research I did. Um, about general statistics. Um, how many people in America today do you think have a diagnosed anxiety disorder? Throw out a number. 20 million, 1 million, 10,000. Any thoughts? 10%. What's that? 10%. 10%? Okay. 1.8 million people as of 2015 have a, have a diagnosed mental illness uh, around anxiety. 1.8 million, that's, uh, I'm sorry, 1.8 percent, um, which is about 3.3 million people based on 2015. On the flip side of that, how many people in America, as of 2012, I, didn't, I couldn't find uh, more recent data, but how many people are actually taking antidepressants and anxiety type drugs? Right? We had 1.8 percent of the population diag clinically diagnosed. What's that? 20 percent, did you say? You're close. You just went over just a little bit. If we were playing the price of the right, I'd have to say, right, because uh, you went over. But 18% uh, of the U.S. population is on, hey, 18% of the population is um, taking some type of antidepressant, uh, anti-anxiety drug. What does that tell us, just from a, a not, not a spiritual perspective, but that tells us definitely a lot of people think they have a disorder or they're anxious or they're suffering from their own anxiety of some kind. Um, but a much smaller percentage actually have a disorder, which is good news uh, in a lot of ways, and it ties into what we're going to study tonight. Because um, some of the stuff we're going to talk about sounds really bad, right? And it's like Joanna is um, describing situations um, that could make us think we're worse off than we are. But remember, um, she's going, she's showing, she's talking about actual disorders um, and um, conditions that have developed over lifetimes. Uh, that people are working through. Some of the stuff we talk about, just because you might be anxious tonight or in life in general because of stresses that, are, that you face, or maybe you're taking uh, a medication to help with that, doesn't mean you're, you're bipolar. It doesn't mean you've got uh, a serious mental disease. So uh, we're not up here suggesting that um, there's major problems. Um, but it's to give you the signs and symptoms and um, ways to overcome anxiety in your life. So this graph is uh, one of my favorites. And I simply show this to you because Joanna's books, like most of the Spiritist books that we read, um, um, from, uh, from either from Alan Kardak, you know, the, the five books that were on that first slide, which is right here, right? All these books, in a lot of ways, uh, tie in to that graph, right? All, all of this stuff we read and we study, um, is about working our way up that graph, right? 
We, uh, we were all created at some point many lifetimes ago in the bottom left quadrant. Um, simple and lacking knowledge. The, the actual word in some of the books you read is simple and ignorant, right? Um, I don't like the word ignorant because uh, it has different connotations. But basically what that means is we were created um, simple and lacking knowledge. We had no experience. We had no knowledge. We were created. And in that first life that we lived, we started the process of growing and evolving. This graph, to me, sums up fairness in the world. How come I am who I am and you guys are who you are? And even though we're all similar, right, we got the same uh, minerals and and we need the same oxygen to breathe. We all got to drink water. We all got to eat. Um, we have um, different color skin. We have different beliefs. We have different attitudes. We have different philosophies. But at the end of the day, we all started in the same place. And regardless of, of where we are in this graph, we exist in, in similar space. And it explains why some people seem like they have a, a dark cloud over their head. My brother. Um, I, it's, it, it's not funny, but the, the joke in the family sometimes is he's, he has a great cloud over his head all the time. If, if it can go wrong, it happens to my brother. All right? Part of that is the choices he makes. Some of that is he's just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but a big part of that probably is where he puts himself, right? Just like where I put myself and where each of you put yourself. The beautiful part about this is the, the, the promise, the guarantee, the the, the thing that is going to happen to all of us, whether we do it slowly or quickly, uh, with less pain or more pain, we're, we're going to evolve to that pure spirit category, um, that Christ-like perfection that he demonstrated when he walked the earth. And Lord knows I'm pretty far away from that, right? We all got work to do. If we're here on earth, um, we're, we're, pretty, we're, we're, we're way down there in that, that third order, right? We're imperfect spirits. But we're working our way towards uh, the middle there, and we're going to get there. So enough about my favorite graph. Let's jump into the topic. Um, that's dictionary.com. That's a good definition. We probably all know what anxiety is, but if you wanted to see a written definition, there it is. Um, I like the one on the bottom, right? Eagerness. I like that definition. Um, but the more common one is uh, distressed or uneasiness of mind caused by fear of danger or misfortune. We all get bad news from time to time. We all get thrown a curve that we're not expecting. And it creates fear of the unknown. It creates fear of loss. It creates uh, fear of the worst consequences you can imagine, even though they haven't happened and they may not and they probably won't. But we get anxious and we worry about it. So Joanna tells us that there's several factors um, that predispose us to anxiety. Obviously, if you're sitting here, you probably believe in reincarnation. You probably believe um, that a lot of things happen in your world today are because of the actions you've taken or didn't take in previous lives. Uh, and that definitely um, ties into ancestral, right, from previous lives. You come in a new body, but your spirit uh, is eternal and it stays with you. And all that stuff from the past, um, you've got to deal with at some point. Um, it can manifest um, an innate fear of strangers, a fear of non-family members. Uh, she goes on to say that uh, it's real common uh, for... for uh, children to, to have fear when they're separated from their mother, which can turn into other things later on, which we'll talk about. But these are some of the factors uh, that predispose us to anxiety. She tells us that the patient is going to present with excessive fear without knowing the reason. That happens to us, right? I can think of times when I've just woken up. Uh, is that the right word? Woken up or awakened? Right? I've got I to gotta work on my English, man. I need, I need, a, I need a tutor. Man. <sighs> away <Awaken it. laughs> um, anyways um, and, and you just have this overwhelming fear sometimes you got a big test coming up you got a big interview um, you got to pay the mortgage and, and, and you didn't get your bonus check you know sometimes you know, there's just different things that happen where your kid um, breaks her arm and you got an $1,800 emergency room bill that you weren't expecting luckily f uh, Florida whatever they're called Florida Hospital let you do zero percent for 12 months and you stretch it out a little bit when you have to. Um, but you have these situations that come up and it um, creates more fear, right? Um, and oftentimes when we get anxious about one thing, right, let's say the job's not going right and you got to meet with your boss, you're going to have your review. You can be so caught up worrying about that, it has other physiological or psychological effects, right? All of a sudden you, your ears start ringing or um, 
you, you cut yourself shaving and it won't stop the bleed and, and all these little things add up and, and it creates more traumatic events in your day. Um, so anyways, due to that anxiety, right, these external threats when insignificant become overwhelming. Um, even as an adult, you just don't have to be a little kid. You actually act like a little kid in the sense that you get so caught up in the fear and the anxiety uh, that you're frozen. You can't do anything. Um, and I don't know, that's definitely happened to me over, over time. Um, and I'm, I'm sure each of us in our own way have felt that at times. Except for Tim. He, he never has that problem. No? Never. So she starts off, um, like she does a lot, um, comparing adult problems to childhood uh, origin, right? Whether in this life or, or in other lifetimes. But essentially that this bond with the parent, obviously the whole idea, right, is that it produces safety, um, right? Parents we associate with safety. You can take a kid in a really bad house, in a really bad environment, but man, they still defend their parents and they're still attached to their parents, right? Because that's their safety net, that's their bond. Um, but you take these kids away, whether it's, it's a good environment or bad, but you take a kid that's having anxiety and you take them away from the parent. My daughter, uh, one of my daughters uh, was like this for still a little bit. Uh, she's eight now. But there was a period of time when mommy left the house to come to the center. She freaked out. Mom, mom would be late. Mom would um, not come sometimes because it was so bad. Um, so she had this anguish because mommy was going to leave her alone. Um, when she would leave, cries in her absence, right? And the child is, is, in this sense, is disturbed. There's something going on with this kid besides mommy just leaving. Um, and the insecurity um, can stay with the child throughout other periods in their life. And we'll talk about some of those signs and symptoms in a little bit. So um, that anxiety as a, as a child, although common, right, doesn't necessarily stem just from issues in this, in this lifetime, right? The, what's a four-year-old know about problems in a lot of ways? Um, so yes, it's common, but there are some underlying issues there that trace back to previous existences, says jo Joanna. Makes sense. Um, the fundamental anxiety she describes tends from feeling alone and abandoned, right? Uh, and that can lead to torment for the child, and, and they find themselves fearing something which hasn't happened yet. And in my example that I shared with you, you know, um, Thursday nights would come, um, and mommy would be coming here for maybe this meeting or a later meeting, and, and the anxiety issues would start the night before. You know, are you going to go to the center tomorrow? The next morning, are you going to go tonight? Can I go with you? It, so all these things would start start building up and she'd be fearful of things that haven't even happened and I know I've experienced that and I'm sure many of you have um, we can get so caught up in our fear that we worry about things that haven't even happened yet to the point to where we can create that situation um, because we're focused on it or create other turmoil uh, uh, events uh, in our life uh, just from the the side effects so she goes on to describe how the child will long for situations where they stand out with prominence achieving conquests that serve from a, an escape from conflict. And I can tell you, uh, in, in, in that example I'm sharing with you, that child thrives on competition. She thrives on winning. She thrives on being the best. And she's an overachiever in a lot of ways. So this is very consistent with, with my personal experience with this. Um, because through that conquest, Joanna tells us, um, we distract ourselves from the underlying uh, anxiety and the underlying pain. And uh, that's a real common trait with anxious people. Um, they will really strive for situations where they can stand out. So deep inside the person, um, she tells us that they're going to avoid emotional in involvement for fear of losing them. Um, and that's something that we've probably all encountered, whether we've done it ourselves or we've been in relationships with people that may be anxious people or insecure people, where um, they, they are so afraid of, of losing the other person, um, they never get totally attached. Right? I can remember uh, a period in my life when I had been hurt really bad, and seven years went by, and there was a long gap of time there when I wouldn't let myself get connected to emotionally. But then I met Christiani, and I overcame, I overcame all that. Right? Um, but the point is, we get so caught up in the fear of losing or being hurt that we don't connect emotionally at the present. Uh, which obviously has deep consequences for us. She, she explains this as, as being in the subconscious, right, of this insecure individual, that there's this need for self-realization. And if it's, if it's not achieved, the escape is anxiety 
that creates irrational thought, perceived weakness, and stressful behavior. So if we don't have the self-realization of our problem, um, these behaviors manifest, and we'll talk more about those in a little bit, but it, it builds, right? Little by little, it becomes this vicious circle, and you have this person that um, is, is jumping all over the place um, uh, because of this perceived weakness and irrational thought. Nobody here, though. So we talked about uh, Joanna and even uh, her thoughts, and in, 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 in this book, um, remember, this is, I forget the year it was published, but, but um, Joanna talks about Freud and defines um, how he compares anxiety to fear. And I love how, how um, this gets tied in with the different books that we read. It, it's, it's, we, we think about spiritism and we think about um, Christ and, and so many years ago, um, but spirits, right? Remember, Joanna walked the earth several times, has lots of mortal experiences to share, um, and, and she was able to take a modern day example from Freud and put it into a book that ties into to Christ's values and, and Christ's examples. And I, I just love how, to me, that helps me make, I, I can remember reading the Bible as a kid, and it was in Old English, and you, you didn't understand all the words, and you couldn't piece it together. But when, when they tie things I studied in school to, to, uh, to life, it, it really resonates with me. So she describes Freud's comparison to fear as, as the child's fear of losing the affection of his parents, leading to anxiety. And this triggers restlessness and aggression. And this feeling, obviously, is very unpleasant to the child. And if it's not resolved, right, then, it carries on into adulthood, into all facets. I, I had a patient many years ago. This guy is 81 years old, and I'm assessing his, his vertigo and his balance, and he had ringing in his ears really bad. And 81 years old, I'm trying to explain to him what's going on physiolog physiolog physiologically, and he looks me in the eye and he says, listen, that all makes a lot of sense, but I know exactly what's causing this. When I was a kid, X, Y, and Z happened, and I've never gotten over it. Right? So, 81 years old, telling me about when he was six, and I'm telling him about his anatomy and physiology. Big disconnect there, right? But he knew what was causing it, and he's 81, and he still hasn't resolved the issues that were causing him all this physiology. I couldn't explain his issue based on the results of that. His tests were normal, in other words, right? But, but um, his symptoms were real, and it was psychogenic is what we call it. And, uh, um, and it, he knew what his problem was, just like a lot of us do. How many of us are stuck in our cages, right, of, of, of frozen effort or frozen, we know what's wrong, we want to change, and yet this guy from 6 to 81 knew his problem and never resolved it, right? And we'll talk about realization and, 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 and techniques to overcome that so we're not 81 in the same situation, okay? Um, but obviously, it's very unpleasant, and it leads to physical manifestations, whether you're six years old or, or 81. Um, and she describes this fear of getting worse. So you take a six-year-old that's worried about being separated from their mother, right? Um, they get so caught up in what's going to happen is that it, may, it, it, it gets worse. It's a vicious circle. And as you age, right? Um, you start being aware of this, and you, and you, and you worry that it's never going to weigh, it's never going to get better, and you're not going to recover, and it just keeps getting worse. So then you have this threat of a lack of resources to meet the needs generated by the situation. Um, and what happens when we have a problem, right, and we worry about it excessively? Any mention of it freaks us out, right? Like, oh, man, they know I've got purple socks on. I don't, but it, it's the point, right? If we, you ever have a hole in your sock or, or like your, your hem is out in your pants or, or you, you put on two different color socks? Sometimes, sometimes I, I, I think I forget to put on deodorant, right? right? I hate that, right? I'm 50 years old and I still worry about that sometimes. Um, but my point is when I have those crazy thoughts, I get anxious. What am I doing if I think I forgot deodorant? Right? I'm, I'm sniffing or I'm, I'm rubbing, right? And what am I doing because I'm so nervous about it? I'm sweating more. And even if I put on deodorant, it doesn't matter because I'm sweating so much. Um, so, and if anybody says, wow, you're sweating a lot, I, I get more worried, right? So it creates this, this fear, oh, I hope nobody notices. I hope they don't realize it, right? And in bad scenarios or worst case scenarios, right, you wind up 
you can have this fear of death, and, and, and it all promotes to this disturbance of anxiety. It feeds on it. Um, those are very simple examples, but imagine if it's a more serious problem, right? So she, she describes anxiety being a strong factor with disturbance and imbalance. So if you think about your daily lives, and I'm not talking about the 1.8% that have a confirmed disorder. I'm talking about the 18% the that might be doing something about it, right? Um, it, it's not something to be joked with, right? It's not something to take lightly. And if, and if you have this disturbance or this imbalance in your life, right, which more than likely is linked to, 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 to your spirit, right, it takes special care, careful observation and specialized therapy. One of my gripes with, with primary care medicine is, don't get me wrong, there's great primary care docs, and I'm not a physician, so um, I, I'm not suggesting that I know more than them, but one of the things I see in my daily practice as an audiologist is a ton of patients on a ton of drugs that don't get along with each other, right? And they create all kinds of side effects. Um, in my practice, it, it, different noises in their head, imbalance, vertigo, just because of the meds not talking to each other. Um, so my point is, when you have this issue, right, you might need more than your primary care doc, right? You might need a psychologist, you might need a psychiatrist, you might need just some more spiritual stuff going on in your life. But the point is, this is not me talking, this is Joanna. It takes specialized therapy to, to conquer this. Uh, so don't be afraid to pursue that. Because what she tells us is, is, is once we're aware of a problem, if with careful observation, and you know yourselves, you know, you know what's going on in your world, right? But by carefully observing this um, unhealthy behavior, right, and this lack of serenity in your life, you're, you're going to be full of expectations, right? And you're usually, they're usually going to be disturbing ones, and they're going to be creating imbalanced actions. So, which lead to poor ethical and moral values, she tells us. So, if you really watch what's happening in your life, you're going to be able to identify activities that are contributing to the cycle and contributing, contributing to the severity. And when you identify these things, hopefully what happens is at some point you have the strong desire to conquer it. Um, and you hear these stories all the time um, with 12-step programs, right, um, addiction um, of different types. At some point, you hit bottom, and the light goes off, and you have this strong desire to overcome, right? And this, this observation creates this ambitious, these ambitious goals. And if they're not guided, if they're not under specialized care, it leads to all of these different things, right? In a truly anxious person, that's not really taking the steps to solve it, what, what does she tell us? It, it causes confusion. The patient will switch from one psychological state to another. Um, moods change from serious to humorous. A need to fill every moment with activities, right? So you'll be doing lots of things to keep your mind off your problems, um, but you won't really produce anything. You won't be productive. And that ultimately leads to a crash that's then dominated by a strange slowness and indifference. So you'll have these peaks and valleys anxious behavior, right, can be stimulated by adrenaline. So as you're getting anxious and depressed and you start doing activities to take your mind off of it, you can do things that create adrenaline. And adrenaline is a powerful drug, right? It's probably more powerful than, than, than most things, right? And when you have this adrenaline, right, this hormone, it, 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 can, it can make an anxious person uh, become very talkative and busy with actions, but not necessarily being productive. Just coordinating their daily activities to be busy so they don't have to face their issues. And then you have these downtimes when you just switch and you become extremely uh, anxious and, and disturbed because at some point you haven't dealt with the underlying problems. Um, so these, these are mentioned. Remember, she's talking about that 1.8% of these heavy disorders, which I'm not suggesting any of us in this room have. But we all can distribute these behaviors during times of trial and tribulation um, and if we can be observant of these signs and symptoms, we can, we can be more quick to act on taking corrective action. And she goes on to say that the more dissatisfied the patient becomes with, with what they're doing, the more they want to accomplish. And they'll jump from thing to thing without planning or analysis. Um, I was guilty of this for years um, until I figured myself out a little bit more. But I just, I, I, I'm only 50, right, which is, I guess, old, but, but young compared to most of my patients, right? I, I've, I, I've probably had 30 jobs, all right, 
over there. And now, luckily, for the last 16 years, I've, I've been pretty dedicated to one thing. But I jumped and I jumped and I jumped and I jumped as I was fighting things like this, as I was fighting various issues in my life, um, until I found some balance. I didn't calm down. So this is a perfect example of how we can create things um, that drive us, that we divide our time so that we don't have to deal with it. Um, but ultimately, um, it's, it's bad because it's going to create uh, demanding and aggressive behavior and these people will impose their will against authority, um, what they consider wrong and needing to be fixed. And I can remember in high school um, when I was a little bit more anxious and wound up kind of tight, I did. I fought authority. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't go with the flow. Um, so classic example of behavior that if you find yourself butting heads with your boss all the time, if you find yourself butting heads in your relationship, um, um, something to consider, right, is maybe this is anxiety that's causing that. This is a great one, right? Um, these anxious tendencies, these anxious beha behaviors can be terrible on a relationship, right? They become turbulent, she says, right? And people will impose themselves um, on others. Um, without restrictions to their contact, uh, conduct, without direction or planning, their behavior changes and their actions change frequently. Um, so if you're in a relationship like this, right, and you see these signs in your partner, um, be aware of it and take steps to try to help, right? Um, but there's a common sign of somebody that's not balanced and perhaps very anxious. Um, you'll see this kind of conduct. She goes on to say that um, we'll see this in relationships a lot. People will go from relationship to relationship um, very quickly, right? Um, they're not happy inside with themselves. They're, they're imbalanced spiritually. Um, they haven't reconciled um, uh, their anxiety or the, the causes of their anxiety. And they're very quick to fall in love and be compassionate in a relationship because that, that newness, that connection, squelches the pain that they haven't dealt with. Um, and those same people can become very controlling, right? They become very demanding partners. And you either succumb to their whim uh, to prove that you love them or, um, or it gets very seriously uh, turbulent. Um, and obviously, the partner can't deal with that for very long, and they take off. And these people will go from relationship to relationship until they solve their problem. Sorry, guys, I got messed up here. Tim, I messed up again. There we go. So uh, she goes on to talk, talk about how anxiety manifests differently, which makes sense. We're all different individuals. We all have different um, levels of, of, of issues. Um, but the characteristics, she says, are, are similar, right? They're, these people are, are stressed easily due to a lack of self-confidence and harmony. Uh, and they typically suffer from depressive di disorders. And that 1.8% we're talking about, um, she describes the, 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 the real disorders, the really advanced issues, as almost always bipolar in nature, which is that extreme high and extreme lows with moments of in, in between that seem OK, uh, but a lot of swings. And the, the message from her is that within our community, there's countless anxious individuals, right? All of us at some point become anxious and, 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 ha and have issues. Um, and the biggest issue is that many refuse to recognize the disturbance that torments them. I, 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 I've known a few people over the years that were definitely bipolar, right? And if they took their meds, right, they felt numb, they felt disconnected, um, so they stopped taking their meds. And sure enough, you'd see these huge swings, huge crashes. Um, very scary, very sad. Um, and I, again, we're not, we're not suggesting that any of us are in that category, okay? But in our own lives, with our partners, with our friends, with our family, as we see these, these behaviors manifesting, um, we have to understand that there are a lot of people that go through this. And some of the habits that we all have or have had, right, we disguise them, right? We, we, we can drink a lot. We can become addicted to tobacco, 
uh, drugs of, you know, not just illegal, but, but so, uh, prescription drugs, or, or sex, right? We can, we can occupy our time and our attention on these vices, uh, which obviously complicate um, our lives in so many ways. I still struggle with, uh, with one of those. Um, when, I'm, when I am stressed out and anxious about stuff, I, I still reach for tobacco. Um, you wouldn't know it. I don't smell like tobacco. I don't smoke. But I'll, I'll put a little pouch right here along my gum. I don't have to spit. It doesn't taste bad. It doesn't, well, my, my wife will tell you it makes my breath stinky, but I don't believe her. Um, I'm kidding. It probably does. But my point is, as much as I get up here and I talk to you about this stuff, I feel like a hypocrite, right? Because I'm addicted to tobacco, all right? It calms me. It helps me control my weight. Obviously not very good because I still got a few more pounds. Um, but, but if you ever see me get really big and then smaller really fast, it's because I've been dipping, all right, or chewing, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that torments me, right? It frustrates me. I know it's bad for me. I know it's covering up something I haven't dealt with yet. Um, but you know what? I'm not, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm not doing drugs. Um, I'm... I'm I'm making progress, right? But I still have that addiction, um, and I'm struggling with it at times. Enough about me. How about recognizing the situation? Well, guess what? I just did that, and I do that on purpose, right? I just shared my recognition of my problem with you, okay? That's hard, right, um, for a lot of people. Um, not so hard for me, maybe, but, but, but it is hard. Right? I just opened a part of me up to you that I don't talk about, I don't know. There's people I've known for years that don't know about that problem. And some of you I've never met, and I just shared one of my deepest, darkest um, uh, issues with you. Um, but, but by doing that, by me recognizing the situation in public, I'm not saying you've got to go out and tell the world, but for me, by doing that, it, it opens the door for me to remind myself that I have this problem and seek some type of therapy for it, um, some type of help. Um, and that allows the patient, right, she says, to seek immediate support from a specialist. Now, um, I've done that with some of my other vices in the past, and it, and it works. You've got to find people that have had your problem, that have gotten help and have been successful with their recovery. And it works um, for me, right, for a lot of things. I've, I still haven't gone to a 12-step meeting for tobacco. Um, <laughs> But you never know. I might try that. Um, but my point is, when we identify, right, recognition of the situation, it creates that opportunity. And if you're at that moment in your life where you recognize your problem and you want to fix it, go for it, right? Find the support of a specialist. Whatever your problem is, um, find a specialist to help you. So what's the therapy for anxiety, right? Uh, Joanna tells us that... Um, Without doubt, all the afflictions and disappointments that, accuse, that confuse the human being come from the spirit which is bound to the conflicts that stem from frustrating physical experiences of the past. And that's not just frustrating experiences of this lifetime, right? When you were a kid or a teenager or the girl or the guy that broke your heart or whatever. This goes way back, right? Previous lifetimes. There's, there's countless stories that we read in these different books. The one that comes to mind is... is uh, the surgeon in one of these books where he's a gifted surgeon. He heals people today with his hands. His hands are gifted, right? But three lifetimes ago, he was a soldier, and he killed people with a sword, right? So his hands over lifetimes were transformed from, from, from a weapon to, to doing good. And um, um, that's, that's our opportunity in this lifetime is as we recognize issues that we're facing, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about past life regression. I'm not talking about trying to figure out what caused the issues earlier in other existences. But when you identify something, don't just assume it's from this lifetime. Assume that it's tied to your spirit, and if you're dealing with it in this lifetime, you haven't conquered it yet. You haven't solved it. And you want to get rid of it as soon as you can, right? The sooner we deal with our problems and resolve them, in this lifetime is definitely always better than putting it off to the next. And they're definitely tied to those past experiences. So over multiple lifetimes, she tells us that the self externalizes the disturbance and guilt that needs to be released via reparative suffering in order to balance itself. When this does not happen, the ego finds itself 
disturbed, restless, and anxious. Well, I'm obviously still disturbed about one of my issues. I shared that with you tonight. I'm restless about it, right, in a lot of ways. And I get anxious um, every time I make that decision to go into 7-Eleven and, and, and make that transaction, right? Um, so all these three things are obvious behaviors that I demonstrate because I have yet to resolve an issue from my past that leads me to that addiction that I described to you, all right? So I'm imbalanced. I'm, I'm a work in progress and I'm recognizing it. So it's up to me to try to change this. And we all have examples of this in some form or fashion. She goes on to say that anxiety disorders occur as a release of the inner drama that lie in the subconscious, that affect the emotional system. And the therapy of release has to begin in the rationalization of the torment. There is no doubt that I've rationalized my torment, right, to myself and to a lot of people in the room tonight. The next step of this for me is uh, taking corrective action. And she says, she describes this, this going from this recognition to a reflection to this adoption of taking steps to get better. She describes it as, as it's a slow process. We've had these problems for lifetimes, probably, right? We've definitely had it for years, perhaps, in this lifetime. She says, don't beat yourself up. Right? Optimism works slowly, right? It develops patience, right? So the fact that you're working on something and you don't always have immediate success, you're going to develop patience for it. Um, it develops balance over time, and it results in a pathway to a resolution. But th that first line, right, optimism works slowly. So true, and we have to keep that in mind. We, we talk a lot about forgiveness here, right? Forgiveness of others forgiveness um, for things people have done to us, whatever. We're asking for forgiveness from others, for people we've hurt. But how often do we forgive ourselves? How often do we look ourselves in the mirror and say, man, I forgive you for that. I love you. You're awesome, right? Gus, when I ever see Gus, he says, awesome. He loves that word, right? And he always tells me, you're awesome, right? He says that a lot. And, 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 and that, that Hearing that from others is always cool, but we got to get to a point to where we can look in the mirror and, and tell ourselves we're awesome. And yesterday happened. It's over, right? We can't, can't go back, but we can forgive ourselves today and move forward. And when we forgive ourselves for today, what happens? We stop living in the past, right? If you, if you did something bad yesterday, well, let, forget yesterday. Let's go back 10 years ago. If you did something bad to somebody 10 years ago and you're reliving it, daily or weekly or it pops in your head, you know, six times a year. What happens every time you relive it? It's happening again, right? Your brain, and there's, there's MRI evidence of this, research, you know, uh, projects on this, papers on this, that whether you're experiencing pain right now in the moment or you're thinking about pain, the same areas of your brain light up. So whether you're doing it right now or you're just thinking about what you did in the past, you're reliving the pain, right? We've got to stop. And the only way you're going to do that is to honestly forgive yourself and, and move on. Sounds so simple, yeah? So hard sometimes. So Joanne is very clear about this. A skilled psychotherapist will be able to de detect current causes of anxiety. So if you're anxious, if you think you've got problems, right, and you're not doing anything about it, don't be afraid to go talk to somebody, right? There's tons of psychiatrists, psychologists, group therapy, 12-step programs. There's tons of stuff out there to talk to other people that have gone through the stuff you've gone through. Don't be afraid to seek out a skilled specialist, right? Because um, they're going to be able to detect current causes of your anxiety, right? Remaining previous causes, which will release the patient little by little through trust, and by encouraging healthy commitments. Um, one of these books that I've read recently, it was a, it's about parenting, and it's called, um, If I Have to Tell You One More Time, right? Um, and it's about all these different parenting techniques. Um, um, for some reason, I want to be a good parent, right? And, and, and what I learned as a kid isn't, wasn't working so well. So I, I said, let me find some help on this. And one of the things this woman uh, talks about is, is finding a way to listen and, and 
hearing what people have to say. And, and if I do this with my kids in the way that this book's taught me, what I found is I don't do anything. I'm just listening. And they're telling me everything that's on their mind because I ask the right questions. And they'll go from this state of anxiety or frustration or anger and just, they're just talking. They're getting it off their chest and somebody's listening to them. And all of a sudden they're calm. Well, and the reason I share this story with you is it doesn't just work for an eight-year-old. It works for each one of us. So when you got something eating you up inside, when you got stress, anxiety, pressure, don't be afraid to talk. And okay, you don't want to go see a, it's on the other slide, you don't want to go see a, a specialized therapist. We all got friends, right? We, got, we've had, we have um, fraternal counseling right here in the center on Wednesday nights. I think it's 7 o'clock, 7.15, something like that. You can, you can come talk to somebody that's trained, not a, not a doctor, not a counselor, but somebody that's trained to listen, right, and help you with some spiritual guidance in addition to whatever medical stuff you're doing. So there's outlets. You don't have to keep all this inside. If nothing else, we've all got a good friend that may seem more rational than us or more developed than us, right? Don't be afraid to unload on your friends, okay, um, and seek some help. Um, and it's through this this little by this release, little by little, right, that trust develops not only in this in others, but trust in ourselves that we are recognizing our problem. We've identified where we want to be, and we are going to be more open to accepting healthy commitments. And what are some of those healthy things, right, uh, that we can do? Um, We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Right? And it's real simple stuff that we may not have thought about, but the, the key here before we move on to treatment, right, is taking responsibility. Forgiving yourself for the offense, taking responsibility for things left undone, and then making the purpose of your life, right, to try to overcome that. What does she say here, right? Take responsibility for the psychological disorder and needs to understand the purpose of this life. What is the purpose of this life? We all have one, right? And it goes beyond our, our career, our relationships. It, it's right here, right? It's our spirit, that first graph I showed you. Our number one purpose, right? We're, we're human, right? We're mortal, but we're spirit, right? We, our spirit is eternal. It's exactly in the state that I put my spirit in. I'm here right now because of all the choices I've made over my countless existences, right? My number one purpose in life is to listen to my conscience, follow the laws of God, the example that Christ gave us, and to grow. At, at the end of the day, I'm spirit. Right? And my spirit is destined, your spirit is destined to evolve. There's nothing you can do to stop it. You can slow it down, you can create a lot of pain in the process, you can do it faster or slower, but the guarantee is you're going to evolve. So in this one life that we have right now, this, whether it's 60 years, 80 years, 14, whatever it is, we got this time to interact with the world around us and to evolve by our choices. And if we can devote more of our time to developing our spirit, all this other stuff gets better because we correct it, we evolve, we grow. And I love it, right? It develops a structure of health and peace as we do more of this. And even though I've got my issues and my concerns, um, I know that when I do some of this stuff we're going to talk about, it's, it's, life is easier. So what does Joanna tell us? She ends the chapter with some really cool stuff, right? She says, devote time to uplifting readings that encourage mental and emotional renewal. I see a lot of people that come in here, right, before the talk. What, did I scare you guys or something? Everybody's leave. Now I'm anxious again. Jeez. All right. But I see a lot of people. I'm one of them. I'll pick up something and I'll read it when I'm here. Right? And that's great, right? And just being here on a Thursday night is awesome, right? You're, 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 you're trying to grow. But how often do we pick up one of these at home? How often do we read the gospel? How often do we focus on, on stuff like this on a daily basis? Because what she tells us here is that all this stuff, if we do it on a more regular basis, it, it, it encourages mental and emotional renewal. It's hard to be down and out when you're praying and connecting with God, right? 
it's harder. And don't get me wrong, you, you still be down and out, but, but it's a little bit easier to let it go when you try to connect. Yoga, um, she recommends to discipline uh, will and the nervous system. Meditation is equally important since it includes calm and well-being. How many of you know how to meditate? Yeah? Cool. How many of you think it's really hard to meditate? A lot of you? Cool. I found the solution. I don't work for this company. I don't endorse this company. I don't sell this company. I guess I do sell it in a way because I use it in treatment. I do a lot of work now with uh, cognitive decline and, and um, uh, dementia prevention through lifestyle changes. This thing is amazing, right? Anybody can plug this thing in. I can teach it. I just taught a 92-year-old how to meditate, and I didn't do it, right? I just showed him how to, I synced it to his, uh, his tablet, and I, I got everything set up. It's, he didn't have to do the Bluetooth or anything like that, but all he has to do is put this thing on. I'll show it to you, right? It's funky looking, right? It looks like something from Star Trek, right? But you put this thing on, right? right? Just like that. It's got, it's got electrodes behind the ears or on the scalp and up here. There's four electrodes. And this thing will tell you if it's placed right. It gives you this color grid, this circular thing. And when the colors fill up, you got connection. And then it gives you this guided step-by-step -step process for three minutes on how to focus on your breath. And it chirps. When you're relaxed, you hear birds chirping on your speaker. Right? When you're not calm and relaxed, you hear the ocean. <laughs> Right? So, so anybody can tell the difference between a bird chirping and the ocean hitting the shore, right? And sure enough, I'll watch these guys and girls over a period of three minutes go from a crazy <laughs> to chirp, 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 right? It's awesome. And then when you're done, when you're done for three minutes, it gives you a report. It tells you how, how, what percentage of time you were anxious, not anxious, but active, neutral, or calm. And the whole idea is to be more calm than you are active. And over 10 sessions of three minutes each, you are then, you, I, I don't even need this thing anymore, right? Now, because of this and my patients that use it, um, they can just stop and relax and take a time out. Um, but this teaches you step by step. Um, I don't know where you, I get them from uh, this, the American Brain Council, um, but I'm sure they're available online, but it's called Muse, and I would, I would recommend it. Um, if you don't know how to meditate or you think it's hard to meditate, all right, Tim, I'm going to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Um, we talked about meditation, how it inspires goodness and love and compassion and benevolence to yourself and those around you. That's all about forgiving yourself, forgiving others, and being nice to the world around you. I'm going to cut to the chase because um, I know we're running short on time. Um, but these are all benefits of meditation. Um, we don't have to talk about them all, but, man, who wouldn't want some of that, right? It's a lot of good stuff up there. Natural anxiety, she reminds us, right? After she gives us these tips, right? Natural anxiety is okay, right? The desire for what is awaited happens, right? It's a normal expectation and healthy. The torment, however, produces the disturbances. So don't be afraid to be nervous. Don't be afraid to be, uh, to be anxious. It's going to happen. But find ways to reduce that from becoming um, more serious. Look at this. Excessive perspiration, heart arrhythmia, right? Fear of failure, torment we're creating this pathological state. Before you get to this stuff, pull out one of these. Pull out Happy Life. Read the Gospel. Um, come to Fraternal Counseling on Wednesday night and, and get some guidance. Um, this, is, this is hope, okay, to me. This is Joanna telling us, look, the afflictions generated by anxiety can be eradicated with the use of specialized care combined with the application of bioenergy via passes and energized water to restore the vibratory field. There's a solution, right? Read some good stuff. Come get a pass after the talk. Bring, a, bring your water with you. We've got a shelf back there. You can, you can put your, your, your bottles of water in there, and all that wonderful energy that's in here gets absorbed, right? You can even take it into the passes room with you. Put it down between your feet, right? And then drink that water a little bit every day until the next time you bring another bottle, right? And lastly, she says, the habit of prayer and the cultivation of dignified th thoughts are the crowning of the healing process to achieve health and peace. The habit of prayer. Don't be afraid, man. Just pray whenever you, you need to, right? Because through that, you're going to cultivate these dignified thoughts. And as you feel better about yourself, as you feel more connected to 
to the source, right? To God, right? What are you doing? You're raising your energy. When your energy's high, when your vibration is good, what's happening? What are you surrounding yourself with? Good spirits, mentors. You're more likely to, to listen to them, to feel them, to hear them. If you're just jumping from thing to thing and you're stressed and you're not taking the time to do this, what are you, what are you bringing towards you? Some mischievous spirits, right? People, the spirits that might take joy in driving you crazy, right? Um, we've all got access to craziness or, or peaceful things. Do some of these things, raise your energy, and attract more positive spirits. And then finally, this is the best slide, right? She calls um, Christ the psychotherapist par excellence, right? And she tells us that Jesus in, Ma in the book of Matthew was asserted in the Sermon of the Mount, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We all mourn, guys. We all face trials and tribulations. We all are our own worst enemy sometimes. All right? But it's through the pain, it's through the lows, it's through the suffering um, that we grow. Right? That we grow. So don't be afraid. Face the pain find help, and just remember, you're destined for perfection. You're doing good stuff, one day at a time. Just stay focused and don't give up. Hey, thank you for your time and attention. I'm sorry I went over time a little bit, um, but it was nice to see each and every one of you. 